Do good work is not a label, but a way of living. It is the constant and diligent effort to achieve a new level of excellence in one's own life. It is the hidden inner beauty behind the struggle to achieve excellence. It's not perfect, but imperfect. It is the effort, discipline, and focus that often goes unnoticed. The goal of Do Good Work is to highlight that drive. The guests I have on this show emulate this drive in their own special way. You'll be able to apply new ideas into your own life by learning from them. We will also have one-on-one episodes with me where we'll dive into my own experience with entrepreneurship and leadership. Every episode is designed to provide you with ideas that you can apply and grow in excellence in all areas of your life, business, and career. Thank you for joining us today on another podcast episode of Do Good Work. Today, we're going to talk about something a little bit more different that's not as popular on the mainstream podcast episodes. Today, we're going to be talking about the dark side of the negative side of stress, especially as business owners, which turns towards depression and which turns into a very difficult road up ahead. Today, I have a special friend. He's my personal coach, mentor, John Michael Morgan. He's a mindset mentor, best-selling author, as well as a business coach and consultant. He's been doing this for over 10 years, and he's worked with some of the world's largest brands and elite entrepreneurs. And I'm talking big name brands, the Googles, DreamWorks, Twitters, I believe Starbucks as well. So he's done this. He's built multiple businesses with great success. He's a very down-to-earth guy. You know why. I love him so dearly and why he's on the show today. And John, thanks for being on. Dude, thank you so much for having me. I am uh, flattered and humbled and honored to be here. You've had uh, such great guests that hopefully uh, I will live up to the high bar that everyone before me (laughs) has set and that it doesn't come to a, you know, collapse at this point. No, and I think to be honest with you, I really do appreciate you being on today because talking about the negative side of stress in business. And as a huge disclaimer, I am not a medical professional. I am not a mental health professional. John, you're not a mental health or medical professional. So if if you're listening to this and if you or someone you know is going through what seems to be the dark side of stress or the negative side of stress, please seek a mental health professional. Um, Asking for help is actually an act of courage and strength. So please seek that help. Today, we're just going to be talking more about John's story battling depression. And I mean, if you look at a snapshot of your photo today, it would be a completely different person than who you were, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So I'd love to learn more about or tell the listeners more about your story and you know, how that can inspire or bring hope for those who are going through a struggle or through a very stressful situation. Yeah, man, I'm, uh, I'm excited to share and uh, hopefully some of what I've experienced and been through and had to you know, deal with may relate to some people. And uh, if it helps somebody, then that would be incredible. Absolutely. So when did you first have the self-awareness that what you were facing may not just be an overload of stress and it could be more, you know, depression? You know, so I battled depression as a teenager, um, very, very young in my life when it hit. And, you know, there was probably a year of me and my parents not knowing what was going on, not knowing uh, what that was or, uh, you know, what it looked like. We had had some family members experience depression, but, Mm -hmm. you know, the thing we learned quickly is everyone's depression is unique Mm -hmm. and how people respond to it is unique. So mine did not look like uh, the previous relatives. So it was sort of hard to identify. After years of that, though, then going into Uh, young adulthood and then uh, which is when I started becoming an entrepreneur as well Uh, what I did not know at the time is that uh, being an entrepreneur can spark depression it can trigger uh, depression so Mm -hmm. and and had I known that maybe I pick a different path (laughs) you know in life Um, but what what had happened was uh, the self-awareness part is that I knew what I had dealt with when I was young and I have tried to be aware of what are my triggers and do I see any of them happening where maybe I can try to get some help before they get too bad or too dark? Interesting. And when you, when you first had the self-awareness of those triggers and you correlated that to the life of an entrepreneur, 
what made you want to press on anyways, even though you knew that this road ahead, you know, consists of strain and stress and different like responsibilities. Right. So it's, it's, it's a weird paradox because um, one of my personal uh, strongest triggers to depression is the feeling of isolation, mm -hmm. you know, feel, feeling alone. Well, I remember years ago when I was like in my early 20s hearing uh, some study that said that being an entrepreneur is one of the loneliest professions you, you know you could have. And so I remember thinking like, well, what have I done? Like if that's one of my you know biggest triggers, now I'm in a career where most people don't think like an entrepreneur. Uh, you, you know, there's not just a whole bunch of entrepreneurs around where all your friends are going to be entrepreneurs. Like it was really trying to figure out like what's my place. But what kept me going was the other side of, I want to have freedom. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to create a life for myself and my family where, uh, hey, if I had to, uh, you know, take some time off, I could without fear of, you know, getting fired, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, some of that. So th this whole thing of like, I grew up hearing about people who were in the nine to five cubicle and they were miserable. And so even though I knew that being an entrepreneur was hard and stressful and lonely, and those things don't exactly match up well with someone who's struggling with depression, the flip side of that, I thought is, if I have a career where I feel stuck, mm -hmm. that's going to be even worse. So for me, it was a little bit, um, I, you know, it kind of sounds like picking the lesser of two evils, mm -hmm. but it was more, even though there was going to be some challenges with entrepreneurism, I knew that the rewards were worth it. And so it was, I couldn't see myself doing anything else but that, but somehow creating, you know, building something, you know, I think one of the worst things that can happen for someone who's depressed is that like, we don't have enough to fill our mind with. And so, mm. uh, you, know, you know, boredom can be a trigger as well. And being an entrepreneur is kind of anything but boring. There's always something yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key things as well as being an entrepreneur, I mean, now day and age, like we're, you're from you know, Tennessee, I'm in San Diego, I'm in my home, you're in your home and we're all connected, but we're also disconnected. Right. And, and, and in those, it's in those lonely or your one, one-on-one -on -one with yourself hours where you're working on your stuff, when you're working with, uh, with clients, or even with you're working on planning or preparing, like even those simple day to days, you're still by yourself and you might not feel that with intentional work. So can you talk a little bit more about how do you fill your mind or how do you fill your day with things that are not only going to help you and if, if you're facing depression, help you counter that as well as help you move forward and progress to be successful in entrepreneurship. Yeah, man, that's a great question. Um, so you're right. Like my work involves me interacting with a lot of people and interacting with someone every day, you know, what, like whether it's, you know, technology like we're using now or even just, uh, you know, exchanging messages online or whatever, but like you know, you would think I would never feel isolated, that I would never feel alone. Mm -hmm. The problem is not all those conversations are something that allows you to feel super connected. Mm -hmm. So I look for that. That's kind of how I personally measure it is I may talk to 50 people this week, but do I feel connected to anybody? You know, thankfully, uh, I'm blessed with a very loving wife who understands what my triggers are as well. So you know, she can kind of help identify and make sure, you know, they stay connected. Mm -hmm. But then it's important to have people in your life that are a phone call away. And not that you're going to call them and say, hey, I'm feeling lonely this week. But I can call certain friends and, you know, talk to them for, you know, three to five minutes. And it's a complete energizing, like, pick me up, it, it, you know, where it's like, oh, okay, you know, I, I feel that connection. But I also think that within that context, it's really important that entrepreneurs, uh, don't freak out and panic. You know, if I go two weeks and for whatever reason it has felt lonely or isolating, there's, that doesn't mean I'm now depressed. It doesn't mean that it's coming, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. It's that I'm aware of a pattern and let me make sure the next week looks different and, and you know, changing up my schedule to, to maybe allow for those things and allow for those moments. But you know, it's tough because the thing about an entrepreneur is everyone expects you to be in charge, in control, on top of things, you, you know, healthy, strong, you, all of that. And uh, I remember hearing from someone uh, recently, they said that, you know, at some point in his life, people stopped telling LeBron James he was good at basketball because they assume he knows it. 
right? Like they may say good game, but how often does someone come up and be like, hey, LeBron, you do know you might be the greatest of all time, <laughs> like, like you are, you know, in that conversation. You know, he, he may not get that all the time, but what if he needs it, hmm. right? Like what if he needs that, you know, affirmation, yeah. that, that affirmation, uh, you, you know, what, what if, you know, that, that's his love language? Like what, what if that's something that's important to him? Well, then, you know, he's got to make sure he's putting the right people in his life that more naturally provide that and can mm-hmm. help with that. And so I think that's a big part of it is like figuring out, like, again, like someone else's triggers listening to this may be completely different than mine. Yeah. So it's knowing what those are and then making sure you're building a life that surrounds yourself with, well, okay, if I know what my negative triggers are, then there's also going to be positive triggers. What makes me feel alive? What makes me happy? What makes me feel loved? What keeps my mind, you know, from uh, being, you know, stressed out? Well, knowing those things and then monitoring them are like literally life-saving. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm writing notes here. If you see me look off the, the screen or for the listeners here for the pause, but essentially you said something really key earlier when you discussed that. I mean, if people who, wa- who are watching the video, John's like six foot seven, right? He's, he's enormous. He's a big guy. He's got the right, beard going right. on, right? If you see a photo between him and me, it's like me hugging a bear. Anyways, the key thing though, is that even as tough, as big, as you know, strong and bearded as you might look though, you still may be open to op- picking up the phone saying, hey man, I'm feeling lonely today. Like I'm not feeling myself. Like having that, shed of like you don't the expectations of the outside world of being an entrepreneur being on top of it on top of yourself on top of your business on top of your clients making sure that everything is working that your your family's working your health is functional everything is good with the finances like that's part of it. it's a strain but it, it's okay to reach out for help and being okay to be vulnerable and that's i think a huge like um and yeah. that can be like a, against a lot of egos for entrepreneurs like oh i'm an entrepreneur i it, should. It certainly can but here, right. here's the thing man there's something on this that nobody ever talks about ever and that is it's not just you know you having the strength and the courage to say that you need help or reaching out what happens when someone's depressed is they don't want to be the burden that's why they're not reaching out when mm-hmm. i was depressed and i wasn't asking anyone for help it's because i didn't want to ruin their day Like I didn't want to be in their way. I didn't want to be this negative dark cloud that was then going to make them feel like crap. And so as a result, I just stayed isolated and wouldn't tell anybody. And so the thing now is like, I've made sure not just to, like you said, drop the ego and say, Hey, you know, I may need a little help or let's talk through this or here's what I'm feeling. That's important, but it's important to have people that are in my life that I don't feel like I'm burdening them with Mm -hmm. that. Because that's the quickest thing. And in fact, I will tell you, uh, even today, where uh, my depression is very much a battle that I am significantly winning, thank God. Mm -hmm. The biggest threat to that is me not having people in my life who I feel like could handle that burden if it got bad again, right? Because I know that's the first thing I would do is I would tell myself, I don't want to bother them. They've got their own problems. They got their own crap they're dealing with. They don't need me to then, you know, pour on to that. So it's this matter of like dropping the ego and having courage to reach out, but also understand you're not bothering someone by doing so. You're not a burden to them that most people are happy to help. And if they're not capable, they're certainly going to do whatever they can to to get you help. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important thing uh, to remember because like I said, for me, man, I went years without talking to people about it simply because uh, I just didn't want to be a problem. How do you open that line of communication though? Because there's, there's two parts here. One, it's uh, knowing that the person is one capable of handling you know, that big of a responsibility. And it's also you thinking that they might or may not be capable because they might rise up to the occasion. But how does that break of silence between dialogue, how do you how do you communicate that? You know, I feel like you've got to do something. You've got to be in an environment where you both have the level of trust that you're sharing, you know, the dark secrets, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, you know, sometimes that's been uh, relationships that I've met through church. Sometimes it's just been over time, our friendship has developed, you know, into that. Mm-hmm. And when someone opens up to me, as a friend and they share, you know, their struggle, 
then I'm able to say, okay, well, listen, here's my struggle. So now you call me if you, your struggle, you, you know, pops up and I'll call you if, if mine, you, you know, pops up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a dear friend of mine uh, who has no struggle with depression whatsoever. It's never been on their radar, like at all, right? Like they're just mm -hmm. always in a good mood, always having good days. It's just not something they've dealt with. Uh, but what they've dealt with is uh, some struggles with anger and mm -hmm. specifically anger of like verbally lashing out at people close to them. And the first time they confided in me, I was like, this is great. And they're like, why is this great? And I'm like, because let me tell you where I'm screwed up. And now when you're mad, you call me. And when I'm sad, I'm calling you. <laughs> like, like we're, we're going to have that connection. That, so, because it doesn't just happen. Like if I've got a friend who seemingly has it all together and they're not opening up, again, like then I don't want to put that burden on them. So I'm yeah. not necessarily going to say, hey, I want you to be an accountability partner and I'm going to call you when, you know, depression hits. Mm -hmm. Because they may not want that. They may not uh, appreciate that. They may not be, uh, you know, ready for that. Yeah. But someone who's also sharing with me, you know, what they're dealing with, then it's like, okay, now we can have an open conversation. So I think, uh, you know, it's just a matter of like, you know, I don't know, like, I'm specifically saying this because I'm a guy. So I don't mean like that this isn't important for women. I just feel like they're smarter than us. So they more easily talk about these things. But like with mm -hmm. guys, like you have to drop the macho, you know, yeah. I'm perfect, you know, everything's awesome kind of thing and have some friends that you consider brothers and you, uh, you know, have that relationship where like you can open up. But those lines of communication you know, it can go there every now and then if needed. That's key. And in the beginning, I mean, you have these frameworks over time that you've learned and developed those relationships. But what about for those who may not have those or from you in the very beginning, how long did it take you for to, to develop that? And what were the early stages for you to be able to have a healthy balance or even a healthy winning, you know, streak against depression in your, you know, early career or when you were getting started, when you first noticed that you had awareness of depression and what, 15 or teenager? Yeah. So it took, it took a long time. It took many, many years. And that's why you can't rely on one method. You know, so for me today, I've got some of the right people in my life. That's a more recent thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know that I had that seven years ago or eight years ago, certainly not 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. So that, that's something that I've been seeking for a long time and still am, you, you know, still am. So what I did when I didn't necessarily have the environment that could protect me and help me when needed. Um, I more relied on those other things I could control. So meditation did wonders for me. Journaling helped, you know, not keeping it all in, you know, mm -hmm. just getting it out. You know, a physical exercise makes a big difference. Getting outdoors. You know, what's interesting is um, there's an old book uh, written over 100 years ago called The Art of Selfishness. And it's a fascinating book because the doctor that wrote this wrote it in a time when the word selfish wasn't negative. Mm -hmm. It meant, you know, basically self-care, right? And there's this chapter in the book called How to Avoid Suicide. Wow. And I remember thinking like, that's a bold chapter title, right? Yeah. Like that, that's crazy. And uh, I read it and the whole book was about getting connected to nature. Like, mm -hmm. you know, getting out in the woods, like not just outside in your backyard, like go on a hike. You, you know, go get out there, go climb something, go run, go get in the dirt. Mm -hmm. And that stuff, you, you know, can help. It was a matter of me saying, okay, I am going to be prepared, but this may be a journey. It's not mm -hmm. going to be fixed overnight, but what I am going to do is just chip away at it. And it's honestly, you know, what made me into the career that I have now, because uh, all of that depression and seeking answers is what led me to fall in love with self-improvement and self-development and reading those books and studying them. And so I had no idea at the time that that would become my career. I was studying those things to save my life. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, now, you know, I look back and depression is the greatest gift God could have given me because I wouldn't be able to help the people that I help today. I wouldn't know what they're going through. You know, so when I get a client who said to me years ago on our very first phone call, they said, uh, my wife filed for divorce, my home is in foreclosure, and I think I may be suicidal. I was like, oh. all right, are you ready to get out of this? And he was like, yeah, like you're it, like you're my last, like this, this is the last thing. And I was like, okay, cool. 
because, you know, while I hadn't experienced, uh, you know, a, a wife filing for divorce or a home in foreclosure, I knew what it was like, you know, to want out. Right. Right. Like, I, you know what yeah. I mean? So it was like, listen, I just want you to do everything I'm about to tell you to do and, and we'll see what happens. And by the way, uh, he is still a client, still married, saved the house, uh, you know, now in a new home, you know, so he, he was able to turn that around, but it's like, the problem with depression is we don't want to do anything. Mm-hmm. And the great irony is like what cures depression is doing stuff. Doing. Right. <laughs> like, you know, do all the things, meditate, journal, get outside, call a friend, you know, build like, you know what I mean? It's like all of that. I wanted to basically roll. I wanted to stay so busy. Mm-hmm. My mind didn't have time to mess with me. Could you dive a little bit into that? So did you just create, take on different projects or more projects or you wanted to, how did you stay more busy in order to combat this? Or was it the combination of business growth or was it the goal of, let me get my mind off of this? Yeah, it, it, was, it was, let me get the mind off of it. So it kind of developed the, um, you know, work hard, play hard kind of mentality mm-hmm. of, hey, if I'm going to work, let me try to build something big. Let me set big goals. Let me, you know, get some challenges here. Let me get a bunch of uh, activity going and get that to-do list really long. And, you know, that's going to be something I can kind of get lost in the work a little bit. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is, oh, hey, when I'm home, let me be home. Let me take my wife on dates. Let's go try new restaurants. Let's go travel. Let's, you know, let's go live, right? You know, being very, very routine can be very dangerous for depression because if you feel like you're in a rut, Mm -hmm. it's not stimulating your mind, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start to lose like the excitement. And so you start to look at things negatively and all of a sudden like there's this filter that changes the way everything in your life looks Mm -hmm. because now you're a little bit numb to it all. Uh, So like this is, I know, a great irony um, because of uh, how his life ended. But there is a uh, song lyric by Kurt Cobain that said, I find the comfort in being sad. And I remember the first time I heard that as a teenager, I thought like that explains how I feel almost more than anything. I was so used to being depressed that I stayed depressed longer than I actually was Hmm. because it became my new comfort zone. Uh Right. So that is the thing. So like that staying busy wasn't a, oh, I'm just going to work myself to death and I'm going to outrun it. It was more, don't allow yourself time to sit there and get lost in your head, you know, and debate everything and criticize yourself and, you know, just rip everything apart. Instead, be like, oh, I woke up this morning, like I got stuff to do. Like I, I got people waiting on me. I got responsibilities. And that brings me to one of the things that I think uh, absolutely saved me. And I've seen it save so many other people, which is the antidote to depression is helping someone else. Mm. Because even when you're depressed and maybe you don't love yourself, you still love other people, right? Like you, you still do care about them. Yeah. And so when you pour yourself into serving someone else, whatever that may look like, right? That may be helping a family member, like an elderly family member that needs it. It may be going and serving like the homeless or whatever. Like there's so many different ways to help people. But when you do that on a very, even just small level, yeah, it changes everything in your mind because now it's not about you. You're not thinking about yourself and what's wrong and, and you know, you know, worrying about the future or full of fear or any of that because mm-hmm. you're too busy helping others and finding new cool ways to help them. Interesting. So let's put it in the scenario where it's a business owner and they run either a service-based or e-commerce store business just online. They're doing the routines. And obviously you mentioned earlier, right? Subtle. Does it have to be a dramatic shift in the routine or can it just be like a small, like instead of taking a left turn today? No, I, I, th- right I, th- I think sometimes the smallest things make the biggest difference. Hmm. Okay. So it's small, small, subtle changes in the routine, but what if they're already going through that? They're already helping the client. They're already helping, you know, the, the team succeed or whatnot every day. And that's the routine. Depression can still hit them. Mm-hmm. Changing subtle, like subtle routines is helpful. But I know that even some of the most successful people, even that I've met or that you've met as well, still battle with this issue. They still battle with themselves. And for that, is it because they're not doing the right things or is it priorities or what do you, have you seen in your experience? 
So I think there's a couple of things. One is, you know, again, like watch out for the ruts, you know, and, and sort of these grooves we get into. To say, oh, well, I'm serving people because I'm leading my team and I'm leading my clients. That does not count. Hmm. That's your job. You're getting paid to do that, <laughs> right? Like go feed the homeless. Like go, go do that. Go have a conversation with them and watch how that changes your soul. You know, like we, we've got a great ministry here in Nashville uh, called Under the Bridge where you can go and, and you line up and you feed the homeless. And I remember the first time we went, uh, we were, you know, there with my son uh, because we wanted him to get involved in, in helping others and, you know, just seeing this. And as you're talking to people, what's interesting is like all these people came for food mm -hmm. and then every single one of them was also saying, do y'all have coats? Do you have mm -hmm. gloves? Like, cause winter was coming. And so it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, we can get that. And mm -hmm. so I remember my wife, Brooke, going to the organizer saying, what do they need? Like, we're going to go home. We're going to put all that together. Mm -hmm. Well, that obviously keeps your mind busy, right? Yeah. That has nothing to do with me being an entrepreneur. It has everything to do with, oh man, like, here's a new challenge. Here's a new goal, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I would say is like, you know, go, go volunteer and sit at your nursing home local nursing home and like read to those people and talk to them, like go do something so far yeah, outside of your comfort room. zone. Right? So Absolutely. Like so far out of your comfort zone. But the other thing is for that entrepreneur who's like, well, I'm just like kind of burnt out. I am making money and that's great, but is this all there is? And I feel stuck and they just don't feel that spark anymore and mm -hmm. they're getting depressed. It's like, then obviously first and foremost, your vision for your life, not for your business, but for your life needs refocused because your vision should be one that excites you so much mm -hmm. that there's this incredible sense of urgency of, I've got to make that happen. I've got to make that a reality. And then you stop looking at your business and your clients and your products as your life. And instead you just view it as that's a tool. Hmm. That, that's it, right? Like that's just a tool. So for me, I really focus now on legacy. Why do I focus on legacy? Because that's like the opposite of depression. You, you know, mm -hmm. it's like now what kind of mark am I going to leave on the people I come in contact with in my mm -hmm. life? How am I going to be remembered? Uh, you, you know, what kind of impact can I have? Well, as I create a big vision about that, dude, now it's not about uh, just all the business goals. The business goals are simply there to be a stepping stone into what that big vision is. So it's like getting massive clarity or coming up with a new vision, you know, doing some soul searching and, you know, figuring those things out to then say, okay, now I'm going to change things up and being willing to, by the way, give up on the fact of you may have spent years building your business only to discover that's not what you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've been there, I've been there, right? I built a seven figure business only to discover I don't want to be in real estate. <laughs> this isn't what I want to do. You know, my vision changed, right? Like I get into it. I get the success. Okay. Now what is this it? Is this all there is? Like, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. So it was a matter then of saying, okay, what do I want to do? And I'm the willingness to try and fail again. You know, we have that one day one, when we're an entrepreneur, we're so excited right? Like yeah. we're all about, you know, bootstrapping and we don't know what we're doing and it's fun. Then we get a taste of success and all of a sudden trying something new. We're like, well, let's analyze the risk. It's like, did you analyze the risk when you started? Because I'm pretty sure none of us did. <laughs> we just had an idea. <laughs> oh my gosh. Into. Yeah. And then we can sometimes over, overthink that or get too comfortable in another comfort zone. But like you mentioned, like, even if you have the taste of success or you're in success and then like, you really ask yourself those difficult questions or different questions like, is this really what it was supposed to be or where I'm supposed to be? Now, I've heard this in the past and I want your thoughts on this, is that uh, only billionaires can be philosophers. You know, I personally disagree with that question, but I do see the lineage of where that question came from, where you have to be, have a certain level of um, success or you have to have um, access to resources or you have to have a certain baseline of comfort to be able to be exploratory right because there are those businesses or business owners who have to meet that you know ends meeting its paycheck after paycheck even if it's in their own business right so what are your thoughts on a the quotes and b 
for those going through it, you know, day by day, week by week, month by month, how can you still have that spontaneity, that different soul searching while you're going through that and meeting responsibilities that are due, let's say today or the end of month, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't agree with the quote. Mm -hmm. um, I find the quote a little bit humorous, if yeah. I can be so bold as to say, because uh, the word philosopher and the original group of people that we define as the early philosophers we're not billionaires. So yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> I thought that was a funny quote too, but I, I, right. I wanted to go into the root of the lineage yeah. of where that came from. Oh, yeah. for, for sure. For sure. You, you know, I, I get where people can get caught up on that. Mm -hmm. um, but that comes back to, you know, that particular thing of like, look, your life, your lessons, your experience is unique. It is valuable. So you can't say that, uh, oh, well, I've not done X, Y, and Z, so I probably shouldn't help someone you know, in these areas. Like, that's ridiculous. If I'm driving down the road, if you and I are driving down San Diego, right, mm -hmm. and we get a flat tire, if you know how to change the flat tire, you are now an authority on cars over me. Because I don't know what to do. I would sit there and cry. I mean, I guess we're in San Diego, so at least the weather would be nice. But like, I don't know how to, how to change a tire. Now, you know how, how to change a tire does not mean that you know how to replace the engine. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean, you know, you're the expert who knows it all, right? It's just these levels of it. So then in our own business, to that part of the question of like, we've got our to-do list, we've got responsibilities, we've got schedules, we've got family that needs us. You know, there is no me time, you know, to sort of work on this. What you have to understand is that when you are not a priority and your mental health is not a priority, you are not leading or serving anyone well. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is like, if your mental health is in jeopardy, you cannot be a successful entrepreneur to the degree that your potential actually is. You can't have a healthy marriage to the degree that it could be. Mm -hmm. You can't be the kind of uh, father or mother that you could be you know, based on that. So you prioritizing your mental health and taking time to explore what you may want to do differently, what mm -hmm. you may want to test is not wasting time and it's not a fun hobby. It's quite literally saving your life and making the lives of everyone you care about better. You know, and this was a hard thing for, for me to grasp mm -hmm. because, again, like we talked about um, the word selfishness earlier, like it's got a bad connotation today. Yeah. You know, but originally that word had no negative meaning. The meaning was, you know, put your oxygen mask on first. Like when we're on the plane and they tell us like you can't help anybody if yours isn't on. So that's the thing is like understand that sometimes you taking that journey mm -hmm. is you putting on your oxygen mask. And understanding, you know, that that means that if you take care of you, you are strong enough to then take care of all the other responsibilities, all the other people in your life. And that, of course, is what's most important anyways. So the beginning phases, which we talked about, is obviously awareness that either I experience depression, I have depression, or I'm going through depression, right? So, I mean, the, the, the initial phases are... I'm experiencing or I have, do you say experiencing or is it I have depression? I usually say I have it, but I mean, I like saying experiencing. Okay. Yeah. So everything that we talked about, I think the initial stages is a having awareness that you are going through depression or that you experience depression, right? There's a difference between awareness and action, right? We, some of the actions you mentioned help others, serve others, Put yourself first. Take the time, even if it's getting out of your comfort zone to wake up super early or stay up super late to focus on those things that, that will save not only your life but support those around you. But that's an action. So there is that gap between awareness and action. And then I know that you've shared with me once that you have failed suicide twice. When I first, In our first conversation, I first heard that, oh my gosh, this guy's going deep day one. But there is that gap between awareness and action how did you bridge that to say, you know what, I'm going to take ownership of my thoughts in my life? Man, that's a great question. I think for me, it, it really personally comes down to my faith. Um, I knew God wanted me here. I knew God loved me. I knew he had a purpose for me. I did not know what those things were. I didn't know what the purpose was. I didn't understand why he loved me, uh, but I knew that he did. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me enough hope to say, okay, 
let me exhale for a moment and figure this out. Like, what can I do? <laughs> right? Like, what, what, what are the, you know, the things? And I remember praying and asking him, uh, basically saying, hey, listen, uh, I, I don't personally feel like I'm worth fighting for, but obviously you do. Please give me something to fight for. Like, if you want me here, give me something to, like, go for, like, something I can kind of hang on to. Uh, interestingly enough, I, the very next day, met the lady who would then become my wife, uh, who very much became, like, that thing. But that didn't magically change everything, right? Like, I didn't then just not be depressed. Uh, it was then me saying, okay, that fight, like you're saying, the first thing I remember doing, and by the way, this is something that I still do to this day, uh, and you know this about me, I immediately changed what I was consuming. Mm. So I stopped having uh, some friends who we weren't having positive conversations, right? Like that was not helping me. I stopped watching uh, certain movies and television that was not making me feel great or listening to music that wasn't you know, helping me, right? Mm -hmm. Like I uh, stopped listening to the news and consuming any of that. And instead, I filled my mind with this amazing amount of positivity. Mm -hmm. And this isn't as simple as think positive and you're going to be happy and have a great life. So it's not that. But mm -hmm. here's what it is. And this is the thing. People think that, oh, if you fill yourself with positivity, that's mumbo jumbo. You're just trying to be, you know, positive thinking BS. No, there's actual science behind this. When you are under pressure, whatever's inside you comes out. Mm. So if you are not filling yourself with good things and strong things, then as depression continues to squeeze you and you start to lose hope, what is going to come out? So mm. that was the big change for me was saying, okay, maybe I should fill my mind with some better influences and some better things. And that, you know, again, like is something that I stay disciplined to to this day, it looks different, you, you know, it, we're always growing and changing, but that was a big thing for me was, okay, um, you know, the, the neighborhood friends that I had maybe weren't gonna be the greatest influence for me. I need to meet some new friends. Well, that means mm -hmm. being okay with having no friends until I meet new friends, right? Like it was just figuring out some of those different steps, but then being very aware of whatever is going on in my head is certainly influenced by whatever I'm putting in it. Yeah. And if I can make some of those changes, even small on a daily basis, you know, it will change everything. You know, I think about people that have a commute and they're stuck in traffic for, let's just say, you know, 30, 40 minutes every morning mm -hmm. and they're listening to the news. Of course, they're in a bad mood by the time they get to work. Right. Like think about, you know, <laughs> what they filled their mind with, you know, and, and it's just, it's that awareness and then, like you said, turning to action of, you know, like we're talking about these little things. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about little things can make this big difference. I do remember, uh, I'm not sure who originally said it. It's been misquoted by everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember this quote of small hinges swing big doors. And I didn't understand what that really meant for a while. But then I finally got it that it doesn't have to be this monumental, let me flip my life upside down. And now all of a sudden I'm cured and I'm not depressed. Mm -hmm. But what it can be is you saying, I'm just going to try to win today, or I'm just going to mm -hmm. try to win this morning. And before you know it, you look back and say, wow, three years just went by and I'm doing better. That's key. And it's the small, it's the small actions. And I remember myself when I went through a conversion experience or like a deep spiritual experience, I had changed everything I consumed everything and then music was the hardest for me personally yes. right okay because but then when you start listening to lyrics or that the movies or what the themes and things about it, it's not about being a prude it's more about is this serving me to serve others mm -hmm. right yeah I, I, absolutely man and i i you know it, it's something that like especially when you're young you're not really aware of but then even as an entrepreneur we're not always aware of it right because we're all trying to stay current. We're trying to stay relevant. So we sometimes think, oh, I need to read uh, whatever are the hot books that everyone else is reading. Mm -hmm. I need to see what's going on on Facebook and Twitter because everyone else is. And I need to see uh, what this person's new YouTube video is because, uh, you know, I got to make sure that I'm, you know, staying caught up. And it's like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. None of that necessarily matters. If you like it and it's good, then awesome. Consume it 
all day long, but actually stop and evaluate it. <laughs> do yeah. I need this? Do I need to listen to this person? Do I need to follow them? Or even do I need this right now? You know, that, that's another thing of like, you know, I, I had to realize that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And, and entrepreneurs are wanting to sprint at everything. And it's like, you know what? I've not met one who's significantly and consistently successful who sprinted their way there. Nope. Every single one of them understood it's a marathon. And the things that we've covered today, I mean, a lot of these things aren't new or they might sound like cliche to listeners, but I, I like a George Lucas quote um, that I read from Little Spark, the book, cliches are cliches because they work. Right. right? It's just, it's <laughs> taking them and then just applying them, but applying them to your specific situation, to your life, to your business, to your to your mental health, how, however you, whatever you can take away to apply, make it your own, put your own spin to it, put your own style to it. Right. I, I think what you're saying is very profound because something that it happens in business and really life, but it also applies to depression as well, is this thing of everyone wants advanced strategies when everyone needs to master the basics. Hmm. You know, I'm always fascinated by like just in business, someone could come up to me and say, um, I, I've really mapped out this long, detailed email marketing funnel with all these different triggers and responses. What do you think? And I, what I'm thinking is you don't even email, like you don't even send your list. Like you're making it super advanced when what you need to do is just get used to sending out emails every now and then. <laughs> like, like, let's go back to the basics. <laughs> Not overcomplicated. It's the same thing yeah. sometimes when we're depressed when we're lonely, when we're sad, uh, when we're just going through something, maybe it's not full on depression. Maybe you're just in a funk. You then think that it's got to take this huge monumental Everest sized strategy to get you out of it. Mm. When the reality is, no, do what you know works. <laughs> like, you know, the problem is doing the small basic things and doing them daily. They're not exciting. Yeah. And so we don't want to do it. It's the same thing with like fitness, right? Like, you know, I know you do a, a lot of intense, like high level workouts. Those come from you showing up daily to do all the little basic things, mm -hmm. right? Like knowing the proper movement, knowing the proper technique to then become fit, you know, but what do most people do? They walk into the gym for the first time. They, you know, get on all the machines, they leave, they look in the mirror and they're like, well, this didn't work. Hmm. Because they wanted some kind of advanced, you know, high level thing. And I get that. Listen, uh, we had a UFC gym come to our town a couple of years ago. And I remember the first day I went, there was some kind of huge spider contraption thing with all these ropes hanging off of, of it, all these different adjustments. And I would like immediately, I told my wife, I was like, that. And she's like, what? And I was like, I'm going to do that thing. <laughs> and she's like, I don't know what that is. I'm like, I don't either. But here I go because I'm getting fit, like I'm about to look amazing. And I get to this thing and I'm trying it and I can't figure it out. And the owner comes up to me and he says, it's for three people guy. And I'm like, what? And he was like, all these ropes are so that three people can use it at the same time. Oh wow. And I'm over here covered in cords and I don't know what's <laughs> going on, right? <laughs> like, and I remember thinking, I should have probably went to like the treadmill. You know, I should have just started, <laughs> right? Like yeah. day one, do something you know, do something you know that works, and then show up again day two, and then show up again day three. And I promise you, when you do that, you're going to all of a sudden wake up on day 30 or 60, or maybe day 365, and you're going to say, I don't feel as depressed today. What happened? Mm -hmm. And what happened was you did the small, basic actions that are sometimes common sense, but don't always feel that way when mm -hmm. we're in the fog of depression. So the daily goal of setting one intention, just, just that one day, and this can be as small as a day to day, just showing up for that one day, that one, you know, objective or that one intentional moment to really, you know, focus on that area of your life, whatever it may be too. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and like we're saying, like people don't always want to accept that because they think, well, it can't be that easy. But mm -hmm. what we have to remember is that most of the time, like what depression that's hard to lift looks like is that it didn't happen overnight either. Mm -hmm. You slowly day by day sink into a depression. Now mm -hmm. you may have lost a family member and you're depressed for that, but that's more grief 
heavy, mm -hmm. tragic, understandable grief that in and of itself is incredibly hard to deal with. But depression in the sense of what you and I are talking about, it creeps up on you. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, oh gosh, I just woke up today and man, I'm back depressed again. That's not what, <laughs> that's not how it happens. Yeah. So getting out of it is that same thing. And listen, dude, that used to frustrate me so bad because really? when I was in the thick of being depressed, I wanted it over. I wanted to be quote unquote normal. I wanted, like, I just, I wanted it done. Yeah. And the fact that I couldn't do something to then wake up the next day and everything magically be okay mm -hmm. made me more depressed. So yeah. I had to just, again, like exhale and be like, okay, one day at a time, <laughs> one step at a time, and yeah. it gets better and better. Then what happens, and this is the good news, this is the encouraging part, you start to see momentum mm. and you get really excited about that. You know, you, you like, I remember when I started to realize that the self-talk that I was using was changing and it wasn't a conscious change. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a minute, like, do I have a different view of myself? Am I, you know, are things happening here? And then that was like, oh my gosh, it's working. I need to do it more. I need to do more of it, you know, yeah. and, and, and rush into it. But it's never just a flip of the switch and all of a sudden, uh, you know, you're back. It's not day and night. Yeah, it takes... That's huge, man. Well, John, I know we can go for hours talking about this. I really do appreciate you being on and talking about this topic. Um, how can people reach out to you, uh, say thank you for the episode, or just get in contact with you? Sure, man. They can uh, email me. My actual email address is john at johnmichaelmorgan.com. That does go to me. Uh, it's not like a fake thing or an autoresponder or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, or they can go to johnmichaelmorgan.com and see uh, from there where I am on like Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Awesome. Well, John, thank you again for being on, man. Truly a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, man.